For an industry built on fun, there seems to be an increasingly exhausting feeling surrounding most things video games year on year. Whether it's big publishers cramming games full of unnecessary monetization methods, games launching straight up broken, or endless other problems, being a dedicated gamer and enjoying what's coming out on a regular basis is harder than it ever was before. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com and these are 9 video game things they keep getting wrong. Number 9. Launch Day is the worst version of a game every time. Who else now actively expects games on launch to be broken, or otherwise not as good as they will be after a month or three of patches. Rockstar's GTA Definitive Edition was an absolute joke, Halo Infinite feels held together with duct tape, string and goodwill, and Battlefield 2042 felt like the living embodiment of publisher meddling versus developer ambition. Even the indie scene falls prey, releasing otherwise awesome gems in need of basic frame rate patches or online stability fixes. I mean, I get it, games are complex magical beasts, it takes a miracle to tame. Hundreds if not thousands of people work their asses off trying to push games out in time for release dates or marketing schedules. Sometimes they just don't get enough time or resources. That is the worst thing about the whole premise though. With more exposure on the industry than ever, we always find out later that the developers told the publishers what wasn't ready, and yet it was pushed out the door anyway. What started as early access for tiny companies on Steam has turned into a business of cash in now, fix it later. Sometimes involving projects the size of of Cyberpunk 2077 that can never be deemed truly worthwhile. Number 8. Overpriced Microtransactions Did you know that if you bought all the microtransactions available in Halo Infinite's first season, it would have set you back over a thousand pounds? Thankfully, after months of 343 being badgered on social media and the game's initial hype cash-in window dying down, these prices have been amended. But with no way to earn premium currency in-game, you're still being pushed towards an egregiously predatory system if you want to engage with wider customers customization at all. Yes, Halo Infinite's multiplayer is free and there is a way to have a platform for content that balances those elements fairly, but so many titles overprice, or fall back on a relentless grind to unlock instead. There's a real feeling of being nickel and dimed at every turn, as if the idea of just experiencing a game and having a healthy relationship with creators is somehow impossible to achieve. Players want to support the IP they love. The issue is the way that things are monetized, and that combo of broken games with insulting monetization is doing a lot of damage. Number 7. Fudging review scores by making things worse later Want to save your game from the dreaded Metacritic score of under 80? Just slap an early access or beta label on. Allow people to buy in even though you know it's broken as hell, and reap the rewards as you dodge those pesky game journalists and their review scores. Another, even worse approach is putting the game out with all elements of microtransactions and predatory BS omitted. Get some great scores from reviewers as it feels like you're doing the right thing, only to then go hog wild with microtransactions, storefronts and price points because the spotlight is no longer on you. With a player base ready to be exploited and their only outlet a social media campaign that might get noticed, it's one of the ugliest ways to treat those who chose to buy your game. Yes, I'm looking at you, Crash Team Racing Nitro Field or Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. Number 6. Embracing NFTs Most publishers are all about making excess money. Toxic soon-to-be-gone figurehead Bobby Kodak ran Activision with the express intent of turning video games into consumer products, cranking out works of art on a pure supply and demand model. He's far from the only one with money front and center though, and from on-disc DLC to season passes, microtransactions to loot boxes, now it's NFTs allowing even the most random element of a game to be individually monetized. Thankfully, the collective gaming community seems to be standing firm against the NFTs we've seen so far. Ubisoft's Quartz platform looked to be barely cracking double digits of users, though a Castlevania anniversary NFT auction did generate generate $150,000, so it's far from smooth sailing. Point being, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. NFTs are the new thing that we all collectively hate, but no doubt some big title, probably whatever Konami does next, will be completely ruined by their implementation. Number 5. Fortnite-style skins invade everything Should a serious shooter such as Battlefield include skins which allow you to dress up as Santa Claus? Did it really honestly need to have it? I mean, of course it did. Everyone knows that Fortnite is popular with the kids and that's packed full of all the zany and wacky characters you could ever want. Unfortunately, that just means that everyone sees the dollar signs pouring in, and every single other game that comes out now seems to have ridiculous skins that don't fit a game's overall art direction. Yes, Fortnite literally prints money for Epic, and everyone wants to copy their success. Younger gamers hoover this stuff up, and it makes complete financial sense for a company to do this in some way. Individuality and inclusion is a major worthwhile factor, but most of the time the implementations themselves 
themselves are just lame. Number four, working game developers to the bone with crunch. If you're unfamiliar with crunch culture, it's when a game is nearing a release date and developers end up doing the aptly named death march, a sometimes unpaid amount of non-stop overtime until a project is finished. While it's impossible to lay out the many variables that lead to crunch per project, everything from ideas scrapped last minute to a lack of planning or something impossible to predict like COVID can factor in, the fact remains that crunch is omnipresent across games, and it results in personal mental health burnout, unpolished titles, and often ruinous first impressions. While stories of crunch have done the rounds for decades, Halo 2 was inhumanly turned around in 10 months, with Fallout New Vegas an ungodly 18 months. As I record this, Raven Software have announced a plan to unionize following their potential Xbox acquisition. Going forward across the board for the industry, hopefully this results in some meaningful change. Number three, battle passes and the fear of missing out. After people started pushing back against loot boxes as a form of gambling, publishers needed a new exciting way to grab money off consumers for the same level of throwaway tat they were pricing individually. Battle passes are fundamentally designed to encourage excessive levels of gameplay for a steady drip of rewards. For a fee at the start of a season, you'll unlock a battle pass and gain access to several new skins, weapons, and other items. The more you play, the more you get. And while some titles get the balance right, many are geared towards artificial scarcity, overly grindy in-game goals or objectives that push you towards microtransactions anyway. Anything that makes it feel like you need to live on a game to get your money's worth, i.e. an item is about to be gone forever unless you just keep playing, is not a healthy practice to maintain. Number two, pre-orders and exclusive content. Pre-orders were one of the original contentious things we all got riled up about, because it's nice to get excited about a game coming out, and it can feel reassuring knowing you've got your copy of whatever a title is. However, one of the main issues with pre-orders is paying someone for their work or an assumed version of a game before you know what you're actually buying. We've already covered the horrors of broken launches, long-form patch solutions, and aggressive monetization, but the gaming industry likes to sting you as much as possible before that reality sets in too. Nine times out of ten, a pre-order will offer some kind of exclusive bonus. It might be a couple of skins for a game, it might be a weapon that gives you an advantage, it might just be a handful of XP boosts or access to more upcoming content that's impossible to really value. Again, all of this is fear of missing out. It's a publisher cashing in on that love that we have for the industry to say, hey, don't you want to support this as much as possible? Isn't this a big part of your identity that you want to succeed? The whole thing is just something that doesn't need to exist, especially in a world of broadband connections and digital transactions. It's a way for publishers to force more sales, always was, and over time we've come to accept it. And number one, the complete lack of innovation in AAA games. You ever have those moments where you wish you could go back and experience a game for the first time again? Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is one of those times. Not because it's a fantastic game, it is, but because it was so innovative and so different from everything else out there. A bold new direction not only for Zelda, but games as a whole. Breath of the Wild shoved you into an open world with minimal guidance, simply allowing you to explore the game using a revolutionary set of physics and elemental interactions. Stripping away the overly handholdy way many other top-tier titles dole out their game mechanics, here it was a return to the old school, to an unspoken bond between developer and player that we know what we're doing. And if you design something to encourage unique experimentation, we'll take full advantage. Moments like this in the gaming industry seem so few and far between. Right now, we live in an era of remix, remasters, and cookie cutter carbon copies of other games that are serviceable enough, but don't push the envelope. I mean, just look at everything Ubisoft are putting out. Not every game can cause a revolution, but sometimes across the AAA space, it just feels like we've seen it all before. And those are just nine things I'm gonna say they keep getting wrong. Let me know which other picks you have down in the comments below, and please subscribe to the What Culture Gaming podcast for up-to-date discussions on whatever else happens across each week. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com, and I'll catch you soon.